Yes. So hello, and I, I'm really, really thrilled to be introducing Dr. Rani Bora tonight for our podcast. Um, Rani is a psychiatrist who now works from the three principles and has, I don't know whether you come with it on your own, Rani, or whether you shared it with Suraj, but the concept of mental wealth. Yeah. 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 So could you tell us a bit about that? Uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to, um, to have a chat with you for your podcast. I uh, really appreciate that. I know that you are doing some amazing work yourself, Soril. So let me just put it out there as well. So, you know, doing some lovely work in the in the field of mental health. Yes, so um, Suraj, my other half, who is also a psychiatrist, and I came up with, you know, you know, rather than calling it mental health, what about mental wealth? And the whole point is that when people talk about mental health, they're actually thinking about mental illness or ill health. And so we wanted to make a distinction because, okay, so when you say mental health, because people get confused. Um, so that was that was one of the reasons why we used the term mental wealth, like, but, but just like you pointed out, Sorel, that also means, like, it gives a sense of abundance, it gives a sense of this richness um, to our, you know, to the well-being. And this is what we loved about the, the term and the mental wealth. And obviously, you know that we had this um, summit last year, the Mental Wealth Summit, mm -hmm. which is very well received. And also we have got our membership where we again talk about, uh, we have named it a Mental Wealth Mastery rather than Mental Health Mastery. So yes, yes that's that's the, just giving you a flavor of where that, that came from. Um, and, and someone was co uh, asking in, in Twitter when someone shared about this, uh, Sami, that oh, is this a new currency, the mental oh, yes. wealth? Is the new currency? And yes, it is, isn't it? It I'm is, thinking, isn't it? <laughs> what about it being a new currency when we talk about mental wealth, uh, and that kind of richness? You know, it doesn't depend on your status. You know, how much money, income you're generating, or where you live, or you know, anything about that. You know, someone could uh, be in a low income household or they could be living in very great difficulties and have lots and lots of challenges and still uh, experience mental wealth. And actually that kind of brings me to the, the notion of the blue sky that you and Sarah talk about. And I know for many of our listeners that will already be familiar, but for many people it won't be. So could you talk a bit about that? Okay. I think uh, I love that, that analogy because it's a very simple way a uh, very simple description uh, that people like might understand even on a superficial level and i think that's a great starting point you know sometimes we just need a bridge when we are talking about something uh, quite deep something spiritual something which is formless so i think the metaphor of the the sky and the and the clouds make sense to people because you know in a way you can see that can't you it has a form yes. because the sky and the clouds you know their form we are, you know we are we are showing people something that they can say oh i can relate to that because otherwise it's very hard to process something so when when we explain to people like look the our experiences all the experiences we have whether they are positive or negative good or bad as as we you know as we label them um they they have a they have a they obviously come all of a sudden sometimes and they have a beginning, they have a middle, and they have an end. So yeah. that's, 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 that's what we say, uh, like the clouds, the clouds in the sky, they have a beginning. Suddenly, you know, it, it's, it, it might be a lovely day, you know, blue sky, and you, know, and you can see slowly that the clouds are beginning to form. And these are very yeah. gentle clouds, like, you know, you can call it fluffy clouds. So sometimes our experiences can be quite fluffy like you know it's a light-hearted experience a fluffy experience and we know <laughs> that oh you know we see that ah it's just an experience nothing to bother but sometimes those clouds can look they look like those you know our experiences can look like those dark angry clouds yeah. out there and we say oh uh, better watch out something is brewing here something you know, we, we are going to have a you know, storm of some kind so, um, and that also can come out of the blue, you know, when we are least expecting it. 
Um, and so our experiences can be like this. So some can be very fluffy and lighthearted and we know this is our experience and sometimes it seems like the real deal. This is the reality and we can really get caught up in it. And when we have, when people are experiencing mental health problems, now this is no, no means by say making, making light of people's experiences or you know what people, people suffering. Absolutely not because I work in mental health and I have seen people in, in the, the whole spectrum of uh, suffering from, you know, from feeling stressed and overwhelmed from time to time to really experiencing uh, what we call, um, you know, um, severe, severe form of uh, mental, mental distress. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, clearly not making light of it, but I'm saying that those experiences, they all these experiences, but they do have a beginning, they do have a middle and they have an end. And they are like the clouds of experiences. We, we can't as human beings, we cannot say I'm not going to have that experience or I'll only have this experience. Thank you very much. I mean, you know, we are not, it's just that we, we can't, we can't pick and choose. It's just like we can, mm. we can choose the sweets or our, you know, you know, where we go for shopping or what, you know, holiday destination we go for, but we can't pick and choose our experiences. We can try our best, but then we will be hit by experiences when we are least expecting it, maybe a memory or maybe because of stuff that's happening around us. So, so what then it is important to point people to is rather than analyzing those challenges and like trying to figure out why am I having this problem and then using the cognitive mind and intellect again and again, yeah. if people were to know that there was this, you know, that blue sky always, which is constant, it doesn't have a beginning, it doesn't have a middle, it doesn't have an end and it's just constant. And that's what we, you know, where we, uh, where we keep pointing people to, because that we will say is our true essence, and that's yeah. formless. But obviously, when we are talking about uh, the this kind of clouds, we are using the metaphor of something which is form, like I said, which can be useful. But the more people, if, if when people even look outside and say, "Hmm, let me think," yeah, you're right. You know, I have noticed this so many times. So, so it's easy for people to then have deeper conversations. Once they see that about the nature of experiences and they get curious about, oh, I'm in, in shape. What do you mean by this blue sky? What do you mean by true essence? And that's a fascinating conversation to have yes. in your coaching and to explore it uh, deeper and, and just, just, keep, just keep looking in that direction. And you know what occurs to me as we talk as we're talking, Ronnie, is that people get as people just can get really upset about the weather. You know, if, if it's been really cloudy and overcast for three weeks, a lot of us will get quite upset about it. But it's recognizing that the weather is not making you upset. And actually, in a sense, when we get upset about our feelings or about our experiences, we're adding another layer of suffering, aren't we, on top of what's already there and creating suffering. Is, is that how you see it? Yes, I think, you know, you're absolutely right. It's like, there's, think about it as like the first layer is just happens all of a sudden, you know, you know, yeah. you think of one layer over our head, it's like, okay, all of a sudden, a sad thought comes to us and we feel sad, or, um, you know, an angry thought pops in our head and we yeah. start feeling angry. And, you know, if we knew the nature of our experiences, the nature of thought, we'll say, ah, this is, this is temporary, it's a yeah. phenomenon. It will go at some point and I'm okay with that. But then, then we add a second layer like, oh my goodness, what's wrong with me? Why am I having this thought? You know, I'm, I'm a coach or I'm a psychiatrist or, you know, I, I, I do all these kind of things and I'm having this feeling and I shouldn't have this at all. And then we're judging the first experience. Mm. And then it's like we have thinking about our thinking, for example, and yeah. then it can be layers and layers and people feel overwhelmed and, and then, you know, one thing leads to another. And, and that's where, like you said, it's like um, dialing up on the suffering. Yes. Yeah. So, and we very innocently, we do it until we see, oops, who is turning the handle or who is turning the knob? It's us who's doing it. And we just say, okay, I'll leave this to itself. And the dial will go back to just like, just the normal sort of stuff. Okay, the thoughts are coming and thoughts are going. So it's really useful to see this. It is, isn't it? I, I realised myself what a huge difference it makes. Yeah. Can, can you tell us a bit about how you 
came to understand this, to have this new understanding. Right. Okay. So that was long time ago. Um, I can't remember when, but um, nine, ten years ago. I, 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 mm -hmm. I honestly can't remember. Um, but um, I am a well-being coach. So in a, alongside being psych uh, training to be a psychiatrist, I was always interested in anything to do with well-being. So oh, yeah. I would just take my pen and paper and then go to different conferences or courses and, you know, did life coaching, uh, neuro linguistic programming, narrative coaching, all the likes, you know, social solution mm -hmm. focused therapy. And all, all the time it's like, great, you know, I'm going to use this. I'm going to use this kind of thing. And I was doing the tapping or the EFT. Uh, uh, I trained to be a trainer um, for the for coaches and train, you know, and helping them become practitioners. And um, my my um, my own mentor who taught me the EFT, she left for the three principles understanding. Got, got me very curious, mm -hmm. um, very resistant to it, but at the same time, like very suspicious. Like you know, what did, what does she know that I don't know? Kind of thing. I want to have it all. <laughs> oh, so, I see. Yeah. So um, I finally arranged a coaching session with her. Had a big. Um, aha moment during the coaching conversation when I was least expecting it and and, and since then you know um, life had taken a different turn and um, so that was the beginning of my journey yeah so it's actually been about 10 years I think so yeah, yeah. Or, or, or yeah coming to 10 years something like that okay. so if we come back up to last year and the mental wealth mastery conference I know there was a big focus in that on um, deprescribing. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I to be honest, I watched the film, I'm medicating them all, and was horrified by what I saw because I didn't I didn't know that much about the impact of prescription medication. And and then was very interested to find out how you approach that. And I know it's a it's a is that actually part of your NHS practice, or is that something you have to do on a private basis? Bits of it, yes. So, um, shall I say a bit more about? Yes, uh, please do. Yeah. Yes. So, yes, the the mental health me mental wealth um, summit was not not necessarily about deprescribing, but about just educating people that yes, medication can help some people, but for quite some again for another section of the population of of, of people who take it. It, it can do do more harm than good yeah. and those people sometimes are or you know I won't say sometimes but most of the times they can be ignored or they might not get the right help or they might be uh, misdiagnosed as having something else and I think you know there is more evidence coming up that yes especially with antidepressants um, that's a problem because people mm -hmm. it's easy to start people on medication but when it comes to uh, coming off uh, coming off medication there's very little support and sometimes the information given is wrong like even now i can you know uh, i hear of people saying oh someone just my doctor told me to just you know um take every alternate day uh, medication and stop in two weeks time or something and then they uh, they have severe withdrawal symptoms which is then then they're told that oh your depression has come back so you need to go back on the medication because it, if it's withdrawal symptom and they start, you know, they recommence some medication, they will start to feel better. Even people think, oh, so I, this, is, this means that uh, I need to stay on the medication for the rest of my life. Or they are told that they might need to stay on mm. medication for the rest of the life. So there's clearly some misunderstanding about that. And these are very powerful medications. I, I, I do prescribe uh, medications, so I need to make it very clear. But it's, it's so important that people understand what they are being prescribed, why they are being prescribed that, how would it work, how long do they need to take it for, what happens if this, you know, skip a dose or want to come off it, will they have enough help, uh, you know, what, you know, will they have some, you know, will they have problems coming off it, mm -hmm. um, so what are the side effects, those are the questions people need to ask the doctors, really, really important to be a very conscientious consumer of, of, of medication yeah. if, you know, if someone chooses to take medication. So we wanted to educate people um, and I think the film you're talking about the medicating normal 
is about that it's about you know okay medication might be needed for some people but you really need to understand and you need to then you know once you understand you can make a, a informed decision about you know whether you want to go on it or whether you want to wait for some time or whether you need more support you know or plan your life that kind of thing um, and I think that's a very powerful very powerful movie it's a sad movie because I know that um, those case scenarios they shared and those case examples they are not like rare it happens, mm -hmm. it happens quite regularly I would say that uh, from what I have read and some of the things that I've seen in my own practice and and in terms of de-prescribing uh, all doctors should be should know how to de-prescribe because we prescribe medication so part of our role as doctors is to prescribe medication but part of our role as doctors is also to de-prescribe because if we don't de-prescribe medication who else will you know <laughs> can't be prescribed so it's like the doctors will uh, we need to de-prescribe and doctors do do it but they say safe way of doing the prescribing and uh, if you know, don't know the current evidence base you might be doing it in an unsafe way and causing more harm um, than good to your patients and I, and I think this is why everyone needs to know the latest guidelines on how to help people come off medication because it's not like oh you just need to stop um, you know in two weeks time or <laughs> even though you have been taking it for years that could be very very dangerous yeah I've had um, patients at my clinic who have had that kind of um, advice about they take one every other day. Yeah. And they've really struggled. Yeah. 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 And there's guidelines, aren't there? There's published guidelines about how to go about de-prescribing. It's not as if the information isn't out there. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the best one the, and the mo most easiest one to follow would be the Royal College of Psychiatrists guideline, which came out last year. It's called Stopping Antidepressants. So if someone wants to just Google stopping antidepressants and they put RC Psych or Royal College of Psychiatry, it, it will yeah. definitely come out. And and this is a you know this is very useful uh, useful information to have uh, in hand. If your GP doesn't know about it, you you need to read it yourself, print it out uh, as a as a patient, and then take it to your doctor and say, look, I'm not just making it up. It is mm -hmm. in the guidelines from the Royal College of Psychiatry. Yeah. Um, what would you advise people who are going through that process of coming off of medication in terms of how they can look after themselves and, and get the, the best outcome? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, thank you, Sorrel. So uh, first of all, if anyone um, is on medication and they're thinking, oh my goodness, you know, I'm going to stop it, please don't do it. Please don't stop your medications abruptly. Mm. And this is, you know, every time I, I say to people, because people say they're not even working for me, so I might as well stop it, you know, and, and they just stop it like that. Uh, sometimes people run out of medication because they haven't been able to collect the script and they said, well, I miss a few days, five days or so. I seem to be doing better or I seem to be doing fine. So I, I will just stop the medication. And it's a disaster. I have seen so mm. many you know, people really struggling as a result of just doing that because the withdrawal symptoms might not uh, start straight away, but it might happen after like a month, sometimes a, two months. We call it mm. protracted withdrawal symptoms. So, um, so it's very important that if someone is considering to come off, uh, medic, uh, come off the antidepressant, for example, first of all, they need to have a plan. They need to think about it. Like, is this a good time in my life to come off medication? Yeah. Or am I feeling quite stressed or is there a lot of things going on? Winter time uh, is definitely not a good idea. I always ask people to wait for like, you know, late spring or summertime mm -hmm. um, to uh, sort of if they think that, you know, they want to do that. They should not try to do it by themselves. They need to take on board the GP or, or the yeah. psychiatrist, whoever is prescribing. Um, and to ensure that the doctor have also read the guidelines so that again, so I would say that if you are ready and uh, and you think that, you know, you're doing the best you can and you have enough support network, your relationship is going well, you know, you are, you have made some lifestyle changes and you're sleeping well, you're eating yeah. healthy, that kind of thing, because all those things really help. Then you can, you know, you know, read read what the guideline says, and then take it to the doctor and say, "Can you help me come off this medication according to this?" Um, and I think that would be the most sensible sensible way. 
The other thing I would say is just because they have reduced the medication and, and you know, and is, the doctor says, okay, we are going to do it every four to six weeks it, or, or stick to four weeks. It doesn't mean that every four weeks you keep reducing. Every four weeks you need to pause, reflect, and think okay how am i doing you know am i am i okay uh, am i okay at the moment or am, am i experiencing some symptoms that could be because i you know i have been tapering do i need to take a break or uh, uh, before you you know automatically go to the next reduction um so that's a very important one but like you said preparation is key so i i say to people that look sometimes if they're coming off a, a medication that has helped them sleep for example mm -hmm. uh, mitazapine which is an antidepressant and most people say that um, they help with the with the sleep if they try to come off the mitazapine then they will they could have sleep issues as a withdrawal symptom because uh, insomnia is a common withdrawal symptom anyway and if the medication was making them sleep then if they're trying to come off it that's also going to affect the sleep big time and it, it might be unbearable so what i say to people if you are on something like mitazepine or another medication called tragedone which is also a quite a sedative antidepressant mm -hmm. to just uh before you do that think about for you know how is my sleep you know I, how you know think about all the good sleep hygiene stuff that you know we are we are supposed to be following like no gadgets a, at least an hour before bedtime not eating any you know snacks in between our last meal and uh, and and the bedtime at least giving two to three hours before we you know before we go to bed so that we don't eat anything uh making sure that um um, you know we are like I said no TVs or anything and keeping their phone outside the room uh, making sure that we have enough um, you know we keep, stick to a routine same time sleep every night and mm -hmm. waking up in the same morning at the same time exposing ourselves to the morning sunlight all the, those kind of things really help people um, and definitely not watching the news at night time oh my goodness yes. really surprised how many people you know have watched uh, watch the news before going to bedtime and one of the things i say to people is um, do you have a bed uh, do you have a tv telly in your bedroom if people say yes i say you need to take the, the telly outside your room and you know just put it somewhere else so that you don't, you know, when you're not, you can't sleep, you're not in, in, in saying, oh, I'm bored, so I'm going to uh, switch on the TV or use a telly as a soothing thing to help you sleep. There are other ways of helping you sleep, not yeah. the telly. So that's that's my recommendation about preparing for um, coming off medication. Well, I think the thing about television and news is really interesting as well because the news is so overwhelmingly negative. And to go to bed is full, your head full of all that negative stuff can only make it hard to fall asleep. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's not just, the, you know, news is the worst thing, but it's not just news. It's the, the, the blue light from the screen. And the blue light, of course. Yeah, absolutely. So why yeah. um, at least one hour before bedtime. Uh, I, I, I think people will find that they are going to give themselves the best chance of uh, having success coming off the medication if they were to just look at small things in their life, in their lifestyle and, and you know, because all of those will add up and add to their, um, add to their experience of coming off medication. And you know what, Ronnie, as you're talking, it occurs to me that a lot of things you're talking about are about mental wealth. Mm. Like, you know, what you eat and I was thinking about exercise, for instance, or just being out in nature. All of those things are, they give us mental wealth, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're replacing medication with mental wealth. Well, the thing is that, you know, I use it, um, I, uh, you know, it's a, it's a tongue in cheek, but I use an acronym called MEDS. And I, I put a um, social media post sometime um, out sometime long time ago well not long time few months ago and it says meds not working try this new meds m e d s m is mindful activities like you know anything anything that mind mm -hmm. you know, mindfulness you just like so mindful activities is m the second e is exercise mm -hmm. and movement so that's the second e d is the diet eating real food you know cutting down on crisp and all the sugar and the highly processed food 
so that's the D and S means you know, get the good sleep, good quality <laughs> sleep. So th this meds. So that was that. You know, try these meds instead. But you know, we can't say instead. But all we're saying is that meds. When people think about in, in medication, so you know, how do I look after myself, or what do I need to look after my mental health? We think that oh, I need to you know uh, take medications. I need to do this. It might be helpful um, uh, for some, and especially in you know crisis period, in a, mm -hmm. if, if you're going through a really difficult period and, and so on. But they are not a cure. Everyone will say that yeah. it's not a cure. It might help you numb your emotions and be, be able to slow down your thought processes, that kind of thing, which could be helpful when people are going through an acute crisis. But the thing is that in the long term, you can't rely on medication because they do, you know, they do stop having an effect. Like people, most people will say, well, it helped me in the beginning. It's not helping me anymore. Mm. So it, it's become weak in a way. So, you know, people do develop tolerance. And we know that no, no long term study has been done on antidepressants. You know, the, you know, the maximum has been only like up to six months or maybe up to a year or so. But people in, in real life, they take medications for, for, for years. So there's okay. no long-term study to say what it does to our, you know, well-being, to our physical health and to our emotions. Um, so the more we know that, okay, those those medications do have a role, make sure that you, know, you have all the information before you make a decision to be on medication. And then if you choose to be on medication, great, but also have an exit plan. Like how long mm -hmm. will I be on medication for before I try to come off medication? Because the longer people are on medication, like say, for example, if someone has been on it is you know on it for five years uh, five years or ten years or twenty years it's going to be much much harder than someone who's only been on it for one year for example of course so so, so that that's again we so so uh, all i would say is that have an exit plan because we all need to have a plan anyway like you know uh, ask those questions um so if we know that this is not a long-term solution what is a long-term solution then again like you say it's about mental wealth and you know this is one thing that Lots of these things are free. Nature is free. Mm -hmm. yeah. Going for walks is free. Doing yeah. movement is free. And most people might say, well, um, healthy foods are more expensive. But actually, there has been some, I, I, you know, I don't know whether there has been proper studies, but some the, most people write about it. Uh, that you know, If you add it up, the junk food and everything is more costly than something yes. which is real, real food. And ultimately, you know, they also make us fuller so so uh, even on a very low budget people can you know choose healthy food real food so i think that's really good to know yeah and interestingly um dr ali jaffe was saying that as a student she ate really healthy on a low budget so she knows it can be done exactly yeah. exactly yeah exactly and then we kind of are what we eat don't we i think food is medicine Definitely. And most people don't know about the, you know, the, the gut brain connection. They think, oh, you yes. know, I'm having mental health issues. So I need to, um, I need to take medication. And, um, you know, the, the gut has more serotonin receptors than, than the brain. And the thing is that, um, there is no doubt about it that, you know, how we eat and, you know, what we eat, how much we eat, all that kind of stuff really makes a difference to our well-being and to our energy levels to the way how we feel oh, yeah. and you know we, we know the difference don't we like when we eat something really sugary immediately our body you know initially it might be like we are craving for that because it's a birthday <laughs> or it looks really delicious we crave for it but once we eat it we know that mm, mm. It's not great for me so uh, you know, we intuitively we know that it's not great, but you know, it's just so we don't we, we we can't help it because obviously the sugar rush rush and how addictive yeah. it is. But again, it's like it's a habit, isn't it? Once the more we fall for the healthier option, it's like a habit. We will go for the healthier option, and we might all find something that we really really love about the healthy option. It might be the kale leaves, the kale smoothie, or something else that we really like. Um, but it's small steps. I would say to people is like uh, we none of us can change our habits overnight. But again, this is why I I love talking about baby steps, tiny steps. Even if we do something very very small, but consistently, every single day, because we you know we think I want to you know um, 
put like lots of savings in my mental wealth account, for example. Um, what can I do? What can I do that is in my power to put more and more deposit in my mental wealth rather than depleting it? And I guess then we will all come up with things, you know, that, that we know are meaningful, like just, you know, smiling, giggling and going for dance classes or that, you know, what, whatever it is, you know, uh, or going out for walks and we will be doing more. And the more we do of that, it makes sense for us to eat the right food and have yeah. enough sleep. And I think it's, it's just like a, you know, once you make a, make a change to one area of the life, then you'll find that it has positive um, effects, consequences on other areas of it, your life as well. It makes the next step easier, doesn't it? Say again? It kind of makes the next step easier because once you've made the first step, then you know that you can do it. And yeah. Then you know that you can do the next step too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And sometimes it might just be like, trying to do it all on your own might be difficult so you can have a buddy you can you know find someone else like what we call in mental health we call peer support so yes. support from someone else who's also trying to make those small changes in their life might be a good idea rather than doing trying to do it on your own ronnie i'm going to confess something i am really tired <laughs> Is there, is there something else you would like to tell us? Because I am running out of questions in my head. I kind of like I'm, is there, if there's something we've missed, I'd, you know, I'd rather you said so. <laughs> I think you have covered it all. So you know, what I would say to anyone who's um, listening to this podcast is that it's, it's about time. It's about time we, we pause and... Uh, and rather than going on and retrace or like nothing's going to happen to me i'm fine i'm fine and feeling stress and overwhelm yes you know we we all experience stress and overwhelm and it might be fine but i think instead about taking you know stepping back in our lives slowing down pausing just checking in and asking how am i doing it's really important you know people talk about destigmatizing mental mental health and talking about it I think, but you, we can start by talking to ourselves and checking in with ourselves, like, how mm. am I doing? And sometimes it might be, oh, I'm really struggling. That doesn't mean there's something seriously wrong with you or that you need a label. It could be just like, you are feeling overwhelmed as human. Yeah. It could be because, you know, you, you have been working nonstop. You have been so busy looking after everyone else that you haven't even focused on yourself. So. Yeah. So just slowing down and, and, and so contemplating like, where am I heading in life? Like, you know, what is it that I, you know, I, I am happy with in my life, you know, or, you know, makes, makes me, gives me joy and what, where I'm, am I struggling? And most importantly, knowing that am I taking all my thinking very seriously? Is, 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 that, a, is that a problem? Because I tell you that, it's a problem in everyone's life, including mine. We all take our thinking very, very, very seriously. So true. And we believe our thinking and then it becomes our reality and the clouds become our reality. Yes. So when that happens, it's not about telling ourselves off and saying, oh my goodness, I can't believe this is happening to me. That again is a second layer we talked mm. about, but really stepping back and, and, and realizing that, you know, we are able to witness that, we are aware of that. So there is something else that's going on in the, in the background, so to speak, when we are just going about life and trying to do this and trying to do that thing. There, there's something constant happening or constant, con constant, not happening, but just is. And some people will call it, you know, um, here and now, some people will talk about isness. Some people will talk mm -hmm. about awareness. But I, I do think that in life, if you're just thinking of mind and body, mind and body, personal mind and body, and we are living out the the spirit aspect, yeah, I, I think we are missing a big, big aspect. And then we are thinking, you know, what's missing in my life? It could be just that we are not paying attention to our spiritual needs. And that doesn't mean that you need to be religious because I'm absolutely not religious at all. But it's about knowing that some of the, some of the need we have or urge we have or the 
lack we experience sometimes in life is that like that 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 hunger we experience is a quench, you know, it can't be quenched by the objects out there or us meeting those uh, materialistic goals. It's about explore, exploring more about who, who am I truly? Yeah. That, that kind of self-realization and self-awareness exploration. And then when you talk about the blue sky, that's who you are. I think part, part of that metaphor is that the blue sky is who we truly are, isn't it? Yeah. And the clouds are just things that come and go. Yeah. Yeah. The exploration of that blue sky is again, you know, is the spiritual aspect of the journey. Yeah. Uh, it's so easy to say, yeah, 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 I can understand that. But that, you know, at an intellectual level, it might seem very, you know, superficial. Uh, and, and, and that's okay. That's really okay. Mm. That's how we start. But saying, what can I see about this blue sky? What, what can I, how can I, how can, how can I get curious about the blue sky? Because it's not like we are all carrying our individual blue skies with us uh, everywhere. It's like if there's only one blue sky and we are part of that oneness, you know, what does it mean? Because we are, you know, we know about relationships and people falling out with one another and we are angry with one another. And we, you know, it's so easy to judge people because they did us wrong and they harmed us. And what if, in on the surface although it seems like there are different activities going on there are different people but what if there was a com you know there's a commonality in all of us the beingness the isness that i was talking about yeah. the ever present however you say it life's intelligence but that's if we don't explore that we will constantly be looking for happiness we'll constantly be looking for to of ways strategies to quieten the mind and we we'll go from you know looking for one tool to another just like, like i did i was looking for a tool until yeah. i realized that you know those tools the, those tools uh you know they don't work we all know that from time to time especially when we you know when we really want a tool to work they stop working but really being aware of our true nature is like that's a gift i won't say it's a tool because it isn't but it's a it's a discovery that helps set us free from the human mm. suffering yeah i can totally agree with that and i think that's a lovely place to end thank you so very much it's been absolutely absolute pleasure talking to you <laughs>